Digital friends, it's so good to see you today on this wonderful Wednesday from Asheboro, North Carolina, the, the North Carolina Zoo. Um, your Zoo Adventures team today, Steve will be in front of the camera. And Megan behind the camera. Always glad to have you. And we thought we'll take you to Streamside to introduce you to some of the native animals of North Carolina. Hope you're looking forward to it. And no, they're not all scaly, but a few of them are. Hang tight. Okay, so this part yes. is one where my mother would um, need to turn her head from the camera. Oh, really? She's not a big uh, snake fan, eh? Not at all. I'm not gonna tell you what it is, that, but look at the eye. There's a brownish bar that goes right through the eye. And that's one of the trait characteristics, one of the things that makes this animal unique and helps us kind of identify what kind of animal it is. This is the cut mouth. This is a cottonmouth, sometimes called a water moccasin. We're trying to say cottonmouth more often. They get their name from having a bright, bright white mouth. When they open that mouth up, they do that. They're not going to do it to say, I'm going to bite you. They do it because they say, I don't want to bite you. Go away from me. Leave me alone. So they have that bright white mouth to deter some sort of threat to them. And they're not always in the water. No, great point. You're catching the one up top? Mm hmm Yep. They do not have to be in the water. They're fish eaters. They are. They hang out around the water. Well, that kind of makes sense. And they are... Hmm. Venomous. We'll talk about the difference between venom and poison. when we meet two other venomous snakes. This, however, Cottonmouth, one of those snakes that likes to live in and around water. All right, before we continue, quiz time. No! Yep, quiz time. It's 10 o'clock, I don't wanna take a quiz. It's quiz time. So, venomous, poisonous. Not the same thing. Similar, but not the same thing. So what is the difference? Is it the level of sickness that you get? Is it how sick you get? Yeah. Hmm. Great guess? Not quite. Help her out, friends. Venomous and poisonous. Any ideas? We'll talk about definition in a second. Look at this beautiful snake. Megan, how good are you? Can you get in there? Oh, I am so good. Watching. Well, that is true. Oh, it's dark. You're hiding in a dark, dark hiding. Let's see if I can put a little light. Oh, we got it. Look at this. This isn't the nocturnal space, so maybe a little tiny bit of light would help. Yeah. How's that? Does it help a little nice. bit? Yes. Yes. This, my friends, is a timber rattlesnake. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful animal. How long? I have no idea. They're pretty impressive. Though, I was going to say my best guess, maybe six feet, five or six feet long. Found here in North Carolina. Ooh. Not quite as <laughs> not quite as dangerous. That's kind of a weird word to use. As the diamondback rattlesnake. Diamondbacks are bigger, venom a little more potent. Diamondback, the largest snake in North Carolina. This is the timber rattlesnake. They get their name from the rattle on their tail. 
I was trying to find it, but I think he's got it all protected and covered up. Think it's all tucked under? Mm-hmm. Digital friends, you cannot tell, tail? You cannot tell the age of the rattlesnake by its tail. I didn't do a very good job with that. Nice save. You though. can't tell the rattlesnake's age by the rattles on the tail. Yeah, you can't tell the tail by the tail. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because those buttons on the tail will break off. Longer rattle, maybe a little bit older animal. That's about all you can do, though. Can't do much more than that. We don't see anybody else in here, Steve. Nope, just a just timber you. rattlesnake today. Okay. So. Pretty cool, though. Come back to venom and poison. Oh. Venomous. If you are venomous, watch out. Gotta I've got to bite you or sting you. How's that? Wait, what was the sting? Back here. Okay. Is my tail. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, bees are venomous because they sting you. It's how they inject the poison. It's how the toxin of the poison is put into a body. If I use my fangs and bite you, venomous. If I use my stinger and sting you, venomous. If you bite me, if you lick a caterpillar, don't do, don't do that. Don't do that. Or toad. Right? If you ingest it or rub it on your skin, poison ivy, that's poisonous. It's got to touch you or you have to ingest it. So the word that is the same between these two is toxic. It would be toxin, so yeah. Toxin. Toxin or toxic, yeah. You inject a toxin, you have a toxin in your to make yourself a kind of dangerous. So poisonous, you bite it and you get sick. Venomous, it bites you and you get sick. So that's the difference. It's the mode of transmission. Big fancy way to say it. The mode of transmission, how the toxin is put in you or on you, makes you venomous or poisonous. I don't know if you can get this one, Megan. How good are you again? Look at this coming around the corner down here. This friend down here is moving. Let's see. I bet some of my uh, fellow North Carolinians, Fred, could probably identify this animal. Hey, check this out, Megan. Look to your right. We'll come back to the van. Look at this. Look at the Keeper Adrian's doing over here. Look at this. Keeper Adrian, he can't hear us, oh, oh. working with the barred owl, desensing to touch, probably right there. So a touch and then a, and then a re reward or a treat. That's that operant conditioning. We've seen that before. Now we're kind of, he doesn't know we're doing this. Oh, maybe now he does. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that's what's going on. A little bit of training. There's the touch, desense to touch. Maybe they need to catch her up for something. Maybe they're wanting to do an injection. They get vaccines. Maybe they're getting a shot. Just desensing um, that barred owl to touch. That was kind of cool. Thank yeah. you, Keeper Adrian. Even though you can't hear us, we appreciate that. <laughs> Let's come back to the venom and the poison. We'll go to the barred owl in a moment. Still on the move over I here. These, I think these snakes are gorgeous. They are simply, simply stunning animals. This, digital friends, is your copperhead. Megan doing a great job of trying to catch that copperhead for you and there, as far as the head itself and the look. Looks more golden to me. You think it looks more goldy? I guess it's because I've seen them darker and lighter. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just a beautiful snake. And I've always been told that if you look close, mm -hmm. the Hershey's Kisses. Oh my goodness. Can you see the Hershey Kisses on the side? Oh, that's cute. So that's one way you can tell a copperhead because they get misidentified with a lot of other snakes. Well, I saw the timber had yeah. bands. Yep. This, these bands are just a little more uh, kiss shape. Yeah, there you go. Kind of like hourglass. That's uh, another thing I've yeah. heard before. That the Hershey's Kisses kind of make an hourglass shape. So they're dark bands next to white or light colored bands. And that coppery, or as Megan said, kind of a golden head. Kind of depends on the animal. 
Right here, maybe. Come on. And, just you, and I if can you see. look, you can look for days and miss this animal oh. when it's right in front of you. So true. Look up copperhead camouflage. It'll blow you away. Absolutely. But that's how a lot of injuries happen. It's not mm-hmm. because they're attacking people or they're after people. Their goal is to stay camouflaged and hidden. So if they're hidden so well that you accidentally step on one mm-hmm. or a little too close, yep, their reaction is going to be to bite. Nope. Awesome point, Megan. Awesome point. Oh, look. You find another one? Oh, yeah. I'm curled up sleeping. Oh, yeah. So that one looks a little bit darker. Mm-hmm. And again, there, as you can see, kind of the cot, you can kind of see mm-hmm. that Hershey's Kiss, which looks like a hourglass band from one side to the other. This little rattlesnake, it sounds almost like a, if you listen to the rattle, it's almost like a buzz. This is the pygmy rattlesnake, a very small rattlesnake found in extreme southeastern. North Carolina, usually in the Sand Hills region. But watch this as Megan pulls back. There's a second one in there. Digital friends, can you use your skills of observation to find that well camouflaged, that well hidden second pygmy rattlesnake? They are so pretty. I love that coloration. And they have more spots than bands. It's not really, Ooh. yeah, it's almost a. It's like a hyphen. Great point, yeah. How you doing, digital friends? Can you find that last? Can you find that second animal? I'll tell you, it's not towards the front of the habitat. It's not where the other one is. Not where this one is. If I can point to it, I probably can't. Nope, I got you. So way back there, in the very back, in the very back. Did you find it? Digital friends, did you find it? I don't know if we can find this one over here, Megan. Is there a snake over there? No, 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 no. Oh. This is where Adrian was working with Sam, the barred owl, a second ago. Oh, okay, good. And she's kind of hiding. Can you find her? Sam! She can't hear you. Sam! She can't hear you. Aw. There she is. Let's zoom in a little bit. There we go. So we got lucky. Adrian walked past by. Keeper Adrian walked by a second ago. We were like, hey, hold on a second. He was saying some of the other training they're doing with her. So you saw that touch behavior. They're actually trying to do a keel score on her. A keel score is they can touch her breast. They can touch her chest. And they can see how much muscle is in there. And having a good keel score is healthy. So they do that with a lot of the birds here, try to see how strong those, that, those muscles are. So they're trying to condition her to be touched on the keel. She's also, she'll also go into a crate. They're trying to do all kinds of behaviors with her they, so they can touch her. So that's one of the things that you saw Keeper Adrian working on. And if you didn't see, if you're just now tuning in, if you didn't see it, oh, it was probably five, six minutes ago, you can see Adrian doing a little bit of training with Sam, the barred owl. You can see pretty easy where they get their name. Those wonderful bars on the chest. It's B-A-R-R-E-D. Digital friends. She, she has kind of a tan chest with brown vertical bars on it. And that's where she gets her name. Barred owl. Nocturnal, meaning they're active during the... That's almost too easy for you all. No. They're active during the knock? Yeah. No, no, no. Night. Oh. You're close. Yeah. Start Nocturn. Maybe knock is Latin or Greek for night. Actually, I think it is because in Harry Potter, they're like, you know, isn't the, it's Lumus for light and then knocks for turning the light off of the wand? Yeah. So. We knocks, need curator Beth to tell nocturnal. us this because she knows this stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. Cool All story. Right. I'm going with you. I'm going with it. <laughs> This is a raptor. Now, I do know raptor is Latin for raptus, mm. meaning to seize or to grasp. Oh. How about that for a, also giving you a little bit of, a, of, a, of an English Latin lesson, 
digital friends. You're in here. And our friends are like, Steve, Megan, little after 10 in the morning. I don't need a Latin lesson. Words are funny. <laughs> they are funny, right? And if you can learn those, those, some of those prefixes and suffixes, it gives you an idea of what the words might mean. Barred owl, nocturnal, raptor, those sharp, sharp talons to grasp their food. The mouth is just where the food goes in and out. They don't chew their food. They will tear it maybe from time to time. Let's see but if I can it's... zoom in on the talons a little bit. Oh, good luck. Oh! You good? A little bit. It's shaking, though. I'm going to zoom uh. out so I don't make you guys <laughs> nauseous. Okay. Fair enough. Diesel friends, how far can they turn their head? They as cannot. far as they want. As far... Well, I really can't argue with that. <laughs> As far as they want, can't be wrong. So I'll say, yes. <laughs> and then I'll come back with, what's the maximum distance they can turn their head? Oh. How's that? That's a better question. All right. So I have a skull. Oh, yeah. It's fake. I've okay. Never heard of that. It's fake skull. Do, do, do. <laughs> so these birds can turn their head from here to here. That's like you and me. Right. Do. Two, right. two, two. That's shoulder to shoulder, essentially. Yeah. That's you and me. These guys can go toot, toot, jute. Whoa. 270 degrees, three quarters of a circle, or on a clock, it's like going from 12 o'clock to 9, 6, 3, or 12 o'clock to 3, 6, 9. So you put it on the on the ramp on the bar, and then we can see, yeah. Here. So like, yeah. So. Whoop. Look at that catch. <laughs> so, yep. This is straight at us. Okay. Right. And then normal. Boop. This is the one eighty left and right. Yep. So and boop. Then he's going. Um, boop. One more. Boop. And a little bit more, but not quite all the way. So two hundred and seventy degrees, both ways. I can go this way too if I'm an owl. They can't turn their head all the way around. If they could, their head would spin off like the top of a peanut butter jar. That would be very scary. Right? Not a very good adaptation to have. I, so, I want to keep my head attached. Right. So they can go pretty far, but not all the way. Barred owl at the North Carolina Zoo. Sam. Please check this out. What do you find, Megan? What you got? Words. Wor wor words? Words? And hey, pictures. You found words. Yes. I'm very proud of you for finding words. Words? Ta da! Words! Yay! Nice. So, benefits of snakes. People do ask all the time why app? What's a snake call? What's it good for? Look at this. They're really so important. Things. Right? They're really important. They eat rats and mice and other rodents that can spread disease to you and me. Thank you. Right? Thanks, Thanks a lot. They are part of the food chain. They are food for other animals. And they keep pest controls, pest under control. They keep some of the water clean by eating some of those animals. And then the other thing about them is that you don't have to use as much poison in your yard. Some of you may want to try to keep away some animals by using rat poisons and stuff. Having a snake's around, you don't have to do that. And Which then, is safer for wildlife. Great point. Or Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So if a rat eats the poison and then a cat eats the rat, rat eats the poison and then a barred owl eats the rat or a bald eagle. Another thing that's going on is that there's a lot of research, especially on the on the venom of the copperhead, for studying for breast cancer research. So there's work being done there as well. So they're really important to have. And I get it. Some of you don't like them. And I get that. I do. I understand. I don't like onions. But Quite you don't thing. go out and try to kill all the onions. <laughs> right, right. Right? There you go. Yeah, you're allowed to have onions. I just don't want them. So, so I get it. But realize they have a really important job to do. And if, that, if they continue with the research on the venom of the copperhead, on breast cancer research, wow.
How cool is that? So next time you see a potentially unwanted visitor in yep. your yard or garage, say thank you and move along. And just move along. Well said, Megan. Well said. Just or move if along. it's somewhere you can't move along, call a professional. Yes. Professionals are trained, know how to deal with all of these animals. And they are out there. Yep. They are out there. You can do something. Check this out. I love this. This is kind of a fun little graphic for me, to me. What can you do if you don't want snakes around? What can you do? Well, keep your area kind of cleaned up. Use a flashlight when you're out and about. Wear closed-toed shoes. This is a good for, for a lot of things. I love barefoot and I know. I know. It's so hard. My wife, Lee, is all about barefoot. But if you have a concern, remember the snakes have been there a long time. Do that. And if you get one in your house, an empty trash can, awesome. They're going to want to get away from you anyway. Yeah. Empty trash can is a great place, a great hidey hole. It's like a cave. I can get in there and get away. Gets in the can, put something on top of the can, take the snake out, release it. So easy. Nobody gets hurt. Nobody gets hurt. Such a good thing. One last thing that I like to do, and I've done this with you all before. I didn't bring anything to demonstrate, so I'll use my phone. Okay. You're out and about in the woods. Mm -hmm. You love lifting up rocks. Yeah. Look at the dead logs, see what's underneath of it. Yeah. That's your favorite thing in the world to do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. See, I know that. But if I have it like this, uh -huh. and I look this way to see what's under it, yeah. underneath of it is scared, it can only come out this way. Ooh. Not a good thing. Nope. But if I do this and look over and look under, this animal, the dangerous, whatever it might be, can get away still and not come towards me. So lift the rock up this way to give yourself a barrier still and give the animal a chance to run away if it needs to. Because again, if I go like this, the only way the animal can come is this way. And I don't want that either. And be careful when you are moving rocks or logs or anything because... Somebody might be sleeping really good sure. under there, and you could very easily squish a little friend. Great point, yeah. And if you do lift and move it, so you look, and nothing there you want to lift to see what else is there, don't leave it over here. Put it back. Put it back where you found it. Be That's kind. the habitat. That's the home of many, many animals. Be kind. Well said, Megan. Be kind. Thanks, virtual friends. Don't remember. Cool story. <laughs> All right, well, dear friends, if you've been here before, if you've been in North Carolina, who's been to the zoo before? Raise your hand. Me. Oh, wait. Uh, who's been to the zoo before? Heart. Ooh. If you've been to the zoo before, heart. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> We've kind of taken you on a backwards tour of Streamside, which is okay. There's not a right or a wrong way to come into Streamside or do Streamside. We kind of just chose, chose to do a different route. So come on in here. This is another one of the buildings. All right, bear with us. The light's going to be funny. But watch how good Megan is with the light. Oh, yeah. Magic. Ooh, big old sturgeon swimming by already. <clears throat> Short nose gar going. Long nose gar. This is our large aquatic tank. It's kind of our game fish tank. And this tank is kind of cool because this is this kind of takes families back sometimes to that first fishing trip. That first time they went out looking for animals. They went looking, they went fishing. In here you might find um, bluegill or crappie, the sturgeons that are swimming by. These are a lot of people's first encounters with quote-unquote wildlife. And it's kind of hard to think about that sometimes. But I love this tank because of that. And I've been here many, many times when dad and son, grandpa and son and dad, grandma and daughter, grandma and son, I mean, whatever the combination is. They it's begin a family to, affair. It is. Family and runs in, uh, fishing runs in my family's blood. Does it? Yep. 
Interesting. I used to fish a lot. I went with my buddies, went with my dad, went with my sister once in a while. But it, it's fun. And it is at first, one of those first moments when you're out and about with your family, with your mom, with your dad, with your sister, with your grandmother, with your grandfather, you're enjoying just, wildlife. You're just sitting there. Just sitting there. Well said. Middle of nowhere, listening and watching. Yep. It's the best way to connect with nature. Huh. Look at you. Yep. Waxing poetic. So this is the other tank. Um, not my forte. Fish? Not these, <laughs> not the little ones. So to help you, because some of you may not be anybody your forte either, look at this little fun graphic we have. There are swallow-tailed shiners in there. Well, yeah, of course there are. Right. Look at that. And more shiners. Right? Of course, the, you know, okay. Yeah. Who, who didn't know this there is, were, the, the blue head chub was in there. Right, this I mean, is what my granddaddy would affectionately call uh, bait fish. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> So kind of fun though, you can look here, nice little image of the fish, the name of it, and then you, whoops, I didn't mean to put my hand in front of the camera, <laughs> and you can look right inside the habitat and see if you can find them. A lot of these fish, a little smaller, of course, hanging out together. And like Megan said, I'm sure a lot of folks would use this as a bait fish. Small fish catch big fish. I think that's called the life cycle. Circle of life. Circle of life. Right. And then next to those fish are more fish. And this is kind of cool. Can you show them the box real quick? But Steve, what's supposed to be in here? Fish. Yeah? Just fish. Okay. And a salamander called the hellbender. Oh, that's who must be in this big box. And I am sure Maybe. he's in there somewhere. If we could find Keeper Keeley or Keeper Adrian real fast, they could be able to go, right over there, in that corner, underneath that rock. It's like, yeah, okay, I trust you. Nope. So yeah, we can't find him. And this is, since it's a tour, this is kind of what you're going to see sometimes. That's why you have to stop, slow down, and really look around. But the box is an example of one of our conservation programs here at the zoo. Now that's a half-size concrete box. And that's not full-size. But what it does is they put this in hellbender creeks where, where hellbenders live, and it's the nesting box for hellbenders. They come in this way. This is actually posted, it's facing downstream, so water's flowing this way. So silt and gravel can't end up in it. And the hellbender comes in and can lay eggs in here. And then the male protects the eggs. Ooh. Yep until they hatch. And we've done this because unfortunately a lot of creeks and streams where hellbenders are found are silting up. There's runoff from construction or road development. So there's not as much um, of that dirt being kind of held in place. So you're seeing silting, big rain events, washing more and more dirt in there and where they where hellbenders nest, this is a great example right here, Megan, where those rocks are kind of flattened, oh. hellbenders would nest under those. Very nice. But if those build up with silt and small gravel, there's nowhere to lay their eggs. So creating those nest boxes helps the hellbenders give them a chance or a place to lay their eggs. How about that? What? See, what? I'm ready to go. Are you still looking for the hellbender? Yeah, I can't find it. It's not there. That's not true. I know it's there. I just can't find it. <laughs> How y'all doing? I hope you enjoyed that tour of Streamside with Megan and myself. We truly enjoyed bringing it to you here from North Carolina Zoo in Asheboro, North Carolina. Another one of our tours for you, for those of you who don't like to visit the zoo, but it's a little bit chilly, a little bit cooler. Right now, today, this is the 1st of February as we take this. Temperatures today, eh, 50, 51 degrees. Not a bad day. This is not a bad day at all. I agree with you, Megan, 100%. All right, everybody. So your Zoo Adventures team today was Steve in front of the camera. Megan, she was behind the camera doing a great job. 
as always. We can't wait to see you all at the North Carolina Zoo one of these days soon, but stay safe. We'll see you again next week. Bye now.